Hey, I'm Mark. Let's go. Lots to learn today. Hey, I'm at home through the rest of the year because of COVID-19, although it looks like my school will be having a graduation ceremony on uh, June 1st. You know, my, you might be doing something very different. You know, an intriguing question showed up in my comments after one of my videos last week. What's going to happen in the fall to college football if schools don't open up again? You know, at first I kind of rejected the idea that the school's got to be opening up. And then I read an article that said that the California State University system is going to be doing school mainly online in the fall. Now, I'm no doctor. I'm of the opinion, though, that we can't shut down the country forever. We got to get back to work at some point. Some places where COVID-19 isn't having such a huge impact, those places need to be allowed to open up. People got to get back to work. Some people say that we can't open the country up until COVID-19 is completely eradicated. Well, that's never going to happen. We need to open up sometime. My governor says May 15th, I guess. Cafe Rio, here I come. The question remains, though, what will happen if the fall if schools are closed? Will we have a college football season? And if we do, what's it going to look like? I was confounded. Yes. Confounded. You know, in 2001, to show the terrorists that they didn't win after 9-11, we went right back to the World Series. I guess one way to show COVID-19 that it hasn't won is go right back to college football. Well, if some schools aren't having classes, we might see some schools not fielding football teams in the fall. Wow. It all started with an article talking about how the California State University system would not be having classes in the fall with the assertion that the UC system would follow. How much money will UCLA and Cal lose by canceling their seasons? That's a lot of money being left on the table. Seattle was hardest hit by the virus. University of Washington? Any school in a major city or suburb of a major city has to think about the fall. Pittsburgh? Cincinnati? Boston College? Syracuse? Dare I say that one school in Columbus, Ohio? Yeah, what do we do if those schools do decide to open up their football season? Well, what's in it for fans headed to the stadiums? Well, the UFC opened last week. Disney, Shanghai, opened with reduced attendance, temperature stations outside the park, and masks required to be worn inside. We could probably do the exact same thing inside our football stadiums. But how weird is that going to be? A 45,000-seat stadium with 30,000 empty seats? And what kind of product can we expect to see? I mean, not having spring practice? We're probably going to find hugely simplified offenses and defenses and pretty, pretty terrible special teams. This will likely be compounded by schools having a young team, a lot of freshmen, particularly a young quarterback or a young offensive line. My thinking is that the first few weeks will be pretty sloppy and literally be won by teams that make the fewest mistakes. But I do history, not speculation. And, you know, the closest thing I can think historically to what we've faced in the last few months might just be the situation in college football around World War II. Perhaps we can learn something from the college football experience around World War II. Let's go rope. The popularity of college football goes back to the 1890s with that first game between Princeton and Rutgers. College football becomes really popular in the 1930s. At a time, the Depression, when going to a game was an opportunity to take the mind off the things they were having to deal with during that time. And again, I think in the fall, this is going to be an opportunity for escape those things we're having to deal with again. By the 1940s, college football looked somewhat familiar to what we have today. The Big Six Conference was the precursor of the Big Eight Conference which became the Big 12 Conference, which now only has 10 teams. The Big 10 had nine teams, missing Michigan State. The Southeastern Conference had 12 teams, Georgia Tech and Tulane among them. The Southwest Conference was dominated by the Texas schools, and the Pacific Coast Conference was dominated by schools in California, Oregon, and Washington, along with the University of Montana and the University of Idaho came a tribe from the north, brave and bold, flying banners of silver and gold. Go Vandals, go Mighty Vandals. 
The United States kept affairs in Europe and in Asia at arm's length for as long as it could. But we were committed after the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 1941. The pool of football talent shrank when able-bodied men were headed off to war. In the NFL, a number of retired players came back to the gridiron to relive their glory days, to fill out the rosters of teams that were depleted by men heading off to Europe and heading off to the Pacific. By 1943, some teams didn't have enough players to field a team and had to suspend play. The Philadelphia Eagles and the Pittsburgh Steelers combined their teams to create a team they called the Pennsylvania Steagles, splitting their games between Philly and Pittsburgh. This was true of college football as well. In 1943, all of the Big Six conference schools and all the Big Ten conference schools were still playing. Baylor didn't feel the team, so the Southwest Conference, conference played with six teams. Four members of the Mountain States Conference didn't field teams, so Utah, Colorado, and Denver University played in a three-team league. Four members of the Missouri Valley Conference didn't field teams, so Tulsa and Oklahoma and A&M, the future Oklahoma State, played in a two-league conference, won by Tulsa. Seven members of the Southeastern Conference and six members of the Pacific Coast Conference didn't field teams either. And the nine members of the Border Conference suspended games altogether. Teams from the more decimated conferences struggled to put full schedules together. Boston College, Washington, and Vanderbilt could only schedule five games. Tulane was able to schedule six. The three members of the Mountain States Conference all mustered seven games. As World War II continued in 1944, college football kind of started to balance out a little bit. The seven schools that suspended games in 1943 returned to play in the Southeastern Conference in 1944. The Border Conference returned with four teams highlighted by the Texas Institute of Technology and the University of New Mexico. The following fall, after the surrender of Germany and Japan, Arizona returned to the Border Conference, making it a five-team league. And by 1946, the conference was back to nine members. The Mountain States Conference saw the return of Utah State in 1944 and Colorado A&M, the future Colorado State, in 1945. The addition of Brigham Young and Wyoming in 1946 made it a seven-team conference again. You know, the cool things that emerged from the war was the creation of service teams that filled the gap in the schedules. See, college football players that were called to service were first sent to training for a number of weeks. A lot of the commanders of these training sites thought, damn, I got football players. And they put together teams that rivaled some of the best schools in college football. In 1943, four of those service teams were voted in the top 10 of college football, including Iowa Preflight, which was voted number two in the country behind national champion Notre Dame. In 1944, Randolph Field went 12-0 and was ranked number three in the national polls behind Army and Ohio State. Bainbridge was 10-0 and number five. Iowa Preflight was number six. Athletic directors found other forms of creative scheduling. Uh, in order to keep travel costs down, Vanderbilt played a home-and-home -home series against Tennessee Tech during its five-game season in 1943. Uh, during its similar five-game season in 1943, Washington played a home-and-home -home series against Spokane Air Command. Probably the World War II had to do with players being called into service. The University of Miami nearly had to call off its 1943 season as it was down to one player. Although they had to cancel the first game of the season against Georgia Tech, they were able to cobble a team together using students and a few transfers. They also cobbled together a schedule of whatever games they could get against whatever teams would play them. The Hurricanes went 5-1 and one in 1943, playing a number of service teams and Presbyterian College. Go Blue Hose! Schools filled their depleted rosters by taking transfer from other schools that had dropped their programs. Miami built its team from the transfers from the University of Florida. You wonder what the NCAA might do for athletes and schools that are forced to drop their programs for the upcoming season. 
Difficult times. The weak fall by the wayside. Opportunity emerges for those that are willing to accept the challenge. Between 1941 and 1945, 10 different schools dropped their football program and they never returned. In 1945 though, Wichita State moved into the Missouri Valley Conference, elevating its profile and the University of Houston began its football program. One that would eventually emerge as one of the best in the Southwest. So what about the coming year? What does the history of college football during the World War II era say about what might be coming for college football in 2020? Well, my perspective, and I hate to say it, is that the Pac-12 is gonna get hard by this season. The perception of the Pac-12 hasn't been good anyway. With Seattle, Los Angeles, and the Bay Area being set on long-term lockdowns, one wonders how they can justify letting schools in those areas practice while everybody else is having to sit in their living rooms. Head coach Clay Helton has already stated to USC fan he may have to live with the possibility of canceling the non-conference schedule. If they do play and their athletic departments don't allow them to travel, then the Pac-12 can only get games in the Pacific and the Mountain time zones. Then East Coast pollsters won't get a very good look at what those schools can actually do. The winner of the coronavirus bowl, well, again, I hate to say it, but I believe it's gonna be the SEC. I try not to be political, but the SEC schools are mainly in a bunch of red states where their governors have already taken their states off of quarantine. The schools are mainly in rural cities like Athens or Oxford or Tuscaloosa, which are less densely populated and therefore less susceptible to the virus. The popular opinion of the SEC is that it is so good that even if they only did play themselves, they can continue to perpetuate that belief. Other conferences? Well, again, it might be dependent on who your state's governor is. In the divided states of the B1G, we might see Indiana, Purdue, Ohio State, Nebraska, Wisconsin playing a full schedule, while the other schools don't play at all or have a severely reduced schedule. Ouch. With a nationwide election coming in November, do you really want to be the governor that didn't allow students, alumni, parents, and fans to participate in the tradition and pageantry of college football? Hey, Gretchen Whitmer, are you going to be the one to cancel Michigan, Ohio State this year? You know, Joe Biden could use Michigan's electoral votes in the next election. Hey, thanks for coming by. I hope you had fun. Coronavirus, man. I hope we get this thing under control so we don't have to do any of those things that we just talked about. We don't have to relive what we had to relive in the 1940s with World War II. I hope that we can play the games the way that they were meant to be. Thanks for coming by. I hope you had fun. I had fun, but I'll quit my day job. I would love it if you would like this video and leave a comment. I love the conversations that we have. And next time you're uh, having to get your temperature taken and having to wear a mask to watch a football game in a stadium that's only one third full, remember me. I'm Mark Haggard. I'm a history teacher. And I've gone rogue.